Today I'm going to share what my life as a Mormon was like. Welcome to Candlewick Library. I'm Cheryl. I used to be a Mormon or a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Most people have heard the term Mormon. Even as recent as the last 10 years, the LDS Church put out a huge campaign spending tons of money on an I am a Mormon campaign. They were normalizing the word. Instead of letting people use it as a negative term, they were embracing the word Mormon. The current prophet of the LDS Church, Russell M. Nelson, during that time, he had many talks where he said that we shouldn't be using that name. And then the current prophets of that time would talk back saying that no, it was fine. So of course, as soon as he became prophet, that was one of the first things that had to be revelation from God for him, is that he needed to bring in his little pet of not using the word Mormon. So you will go online now and you will see People get mad in comments, don't call us Mormons, we are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I would not be surprised if at some point in the future it actually is shortened to Church of Christ. Uh, a lot of ex-Mormons have been talking about that for a while, and I've seen that used in a few articles. That may happen to make it not quite a as much of a mouthful, but as of right now, they call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And a lot of members who seem to have forgotten what Monson and Hinckley, the last two prophets said, consider it offensive if you call them Mormons. But I still am going to say Mormon because to me, that comes naturally because it was fine for most of the time that I was a member and everybody knows what I'm talking about. I will also use the word LDS when referring to the church. So when I say Mormon in these videos, I am not trying to be offensive. I am using the word that was okay for me as a member. This and the next video are going to be more of a deep dive into my history. As I've made videos that alluded to books that I would review in the future or books that I've read and I talked a little bit here and there about Mormon things, and as I made the whole series where I did deep dives on the book No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody. I have had questions and interest about my story. What was it that brought me out of the Mormon church? And what was my experience as a Mormon like? Because you can say one thing online now and you will have a lineup of people coming to argue with you that that is not true, even if it's what you experienced. So people want to know the experiences of ex-Mormons because current Mormons will not tell you and they will argue with stuff that's that's true. I had this experience just a couple of weeks ago where an online a woman that reviews books posted a book that had about world religions and people in the comments were really angry about the fact that Mormonism was included in this outside of Christianity and that there was a picture of the plan of happiness that the LDS church has and there were a ton of LDS people in the comments that were upset about that and then also upset about this plan of salvation that the LDS church uses saying that it wasn't accurate and I looked at it and it was exactly what I was taught so I commented back to a few of these people and said actually I've read this chapter it's completely accurate and what about the plan of salvation poster that they're showing isn't true? And of course, none of them responded. And I don't know if they were just trying to say it wasn't accurate because they wanted to be able to add some nuance to it, or if they really aren't being taught that anymore and so they didn't know it was the real plan of salvation poster that was shown before, I'm not sure. People get really mad when you leave the LDS church and you talk about it. In fact, one of the men in leadership in the church, Brad Wilcox, was on a podcast and in it he talked about how he believes it's trendy for those of us to leave the church to be loud about it. When you leave the church, a phrase you will hear constantly, and I very unfortunately used it myself, was that you leave the church and you can't leave it alone. And you don't understand until you actually leave how ridiculous that is because Everyone should be able to talk about what they experienced in an organization, a church, a job, a relationship, and they're not making up lies about people. And maybe that's the thing is that they think we're making up lies, but there is expectation by the people that you still are friends with or family to, okay, fine, leave, but be quiet about it. Nobody needs to know. You need to just move on. I would say that for most of us that leave the Mormon church, it is almost impossible to leave and just move on. It is such a high demand religion and it is such a big part of your lifestyle, your community and everything. Just the act of leaving can ruin relationships. Me making these videos, I talked about this in my last No Man Knows My History video that just making those videos, I lost relationships. So 
it is a huge part of our life. So I know that there are a lot of people that have the wrong idea of why I left the Mormon church. They think it's for reasons that might have been part of it, but aren't the full reason. And so when I had the interest and the questions about why I left and about my time, I decided that I really did want to make those videos. So I waited until I was done with the No Man Knows My History series, and then I decided I would make two videos. This first one will cover my time as a Mormon and how I became a Mormon. And then the second video will be what led me out. When I was thinking about these videos and what I was going to do and say, I felt like maybe it was better just to do a sit down video, just talking and not have any uh, visuals. But I am a visual person and I do like to see things that people are talking about in their videos. So I will be having some pictures that pop up occasionally about the things I'm talking about. So hopefully that doesn't annoy anyone or, or make this feel too produced. I just, that's something that's very helpful to me. So I wanted to add that in later. So my story starts with my ancestors. Some of them were converts directly from Europe that came to Nauvoo. Some were people that had come across on the Mayflower and had been in the United States for a while and then came in contact with Mormonism and converted. But both families were pioneer stock. Both families came across in the handcarts or the wagon trains and came to Utah to settle it. In fact, one of my ancestors is a very famous painter in the Mormon world. Um, up until recently, most of his, a lot of his artwork was in church buildings and the temples. And so that has been a fab family legacy since Mormonism started. If you've watched my No Man Knows My History videos, about polygamy, I did mention on there, I do come through polygamy. So if polygamy didn't exist, I wouldn't be here in the family that I'm in, which is a really hard thing to think about because I am so against polygamy, but I can still honor the good things about those people and I can still honor my heritage. I don't have to be ashamed, but I don't have to celebrate their polygamy. So my parents were both members of the LDS church. They ended up being sealed in the Salt Lake City Temple and having four children. I am the youngest of four. I'm not gonna go into my parents' story too much because that's their story to tell, but they had a few things happen that made them become inactive. So they didn't leave the church officially or forever, but they did step away and stop going to church when I was about three years old. So at that point, I would have barely gone into what they call primary. So in the church, there is sacrament meeting. And sacrament meeting is in what is the chapel. And you have usually a bunch of benches or chairs. And there is a pulpit at the front of the room with chairs behind it. And each ward, which is what the congregation is called, is led by a bishop. And the bishop has two counselors. And those three men are called the bishopric. So they run the ward. They're in charge of, of everything for that ward they answer to a stake president and a stake is a bunch of wards and then they answer to somebody above them and so on and so forth up into the top of the church which has a minute 70 men that are the quorum of the 70 and then it has the 12 apostles and then the prophet in your ward your bishop sometimes speaks they will open up sacrament meeting they will run meetings and sometimes they will talk or bear their testimony but most sacrament meetings are actual members of the ward giving talks, anyone from young kids all the way up. And testimony meeting is the first Sunday of every month. And that is where everybody fasts that day. And when you go to sacrament meeting, it is only testimonies. So anyone who wants to get up can go up to the pulpit and bear their testimony. So that's the first hour of church. When I was growing up, it was three hours long. And the second hour would be Sunday school. And that would be based on your age range. And then the third hour for adult men would be priesthood, and for adult women would be Relief Society, and for teenagers aged 12 to 18 would be young men and young women's. And then, so below 12 would be primary for, for both of those hours. And you go into primary when you're three years old, and then each class for a different age. Everybody's together at sacrament meeting and then split up for the classes. Before primary, there is nursery. And nursery is for the babies that are 18 months old to three years old. Before that, they stay with their mom or dad. So now I know that they've changed that, that they've changed things around. It's only two hours now. And so that second hour, I, as far as I know, before I left, it was switching back and forth each week between Sunday school or Relief Society and priesthood. Primary is always the same. I, I feel like I need to have a little bit of understanding of that before I start this. So I would have barely been in primary as a sunbeam is what it was called back then. I don't know if they call it that anymore. And before we became inactive, since I was only three years old, I didn't 
have any real foundation yet of the LDS church and my family went inactive. So most of my youngest childhood, I was not a Mormon. My family might have considered themselves that, I'm not sure. I would have to ask the other kids in my family and my parents, but I didn't at all. I felt like we had a very religious household, but we didn't go to church. My mom would read to us all the time out of a magazine called The Guidepost Magazine that had Christian like short stories and articles in it. We watched movies about Jesus. We read the Bible together as a family. I don't recall ever reading the Book of Mormon or any of the other LDS scriptures. I don't know if we did or not, I just, but I don't remember that at all. We did have some pretty strict rules. I wasn't allowed to go and do things on Sunday and family time was very important to our family. And in fact, one of the things that the LDS church emphasized for a very long time was family home evening. And that would be that every Monday night you would have family night. And we did that uh, even when we weren't LDS. It just didn't have an LDS theme to it. I had a very strong relationship with God. Uh, Jesus Christ was very important to me as a child. And I can remember feeling like I was having conversations with him when I, when I would pray. I don't feel like I was lacking in a relationship with God as a child. I just didn't know a ton about the Bible because I was so young still. And we were, you know, we were just reading as a family and there wasn't more of a deep study of it. So when I was, I think I was about eight or nine, we visited Utah and my grandfather wanted to baptize me and my old, my brother that was just an age above me because we were the ones that had not been old enough to be baptized yet when we left the LDS church. In the LDS church, you get baptized when you are eight years old. It was a hard thing for my grandparents. My dad's parents died when, when before I was even born, so they were not in the picture. But my, for my mom's parents, who were very, very religious, it was very hard for them to see our family be inactive for so long and to have us not being baptized. So my grandpa asked to baptize my brother and I, and so he did. We were baptized on Temple Square in Salt Lake City, which while I was a Mormon later on, was a very special thing to me. Like I was pretty proud of the fact that I was baptized at this you know, iconic place in a way that most members and most of my friends did not get to be baptized in. My grandfather worked at the temple there. He knew a lot of the men at the top of the church. And so I felt like we had this really cool connection and that I had a really great baptism story. I remember I was given a copy of the Book of Mormon and we have this picture of my brother and I on our baptism day. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know anything about the Mormon church. I didn't understand why I was getting baptized, but I did it just because it was what I was supposed to do. I should probably add in here that my, we were a military family, so we moved around a lot. And at this point we had moved to Idaho. I remember going to school there and having kids in my class say, oh, you never come to church. You're always missing when they call you on the roll. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they would say, oh, well, you're Mormon like us. And they, your name is in our class and they call on you every week, but you're not there. And I was like, I'm not Mormon. And because I just had no concept of the fact that my family was and that after I was baptized, I technically was. But then we had some family things happen that led to my parents becoming closer to the bishop of the ward that would have been, that we would have been in, in Idaho. And they decided to try going back to church. And apparently my mom and my sister felt immediately like they were back where they were supposed to be when they started going because for them it had been something that was ingrained in them. And so it felt like coming back to something that that was familiar. So then we moved to Washington State. And so that is my first memory of going, actively going to the LDS church. I did not like it at first. We had missionaries coming to our house and they were discussing, doing kind of the discussions they would do with converts uh, with us to help, probably me mostly, to understand the LDS church. And I used to get in arguments with the missionaries. I don't know if my family remembers this, my mom probably does more than anybody, but I would get really mad and when they were talking about heaven and they would say, you know, you have to do this to get into the celestial kingdom and I would bring out names like, well, what about Mother Teresa or what about this person or what about this person that were names that I knew at that time from books that I'd read about people that I thought were doing really good things and in my mind, I was thinking if this person is religious and believes in God and Jesus and is doing good things, I didn't understand, I didn't understand everything about grace or salvation at that time, obviously. I was about 11 at this time. I felt like that their version of who got into heaven and what heaven was didn't make sense to me. So I would argue it back with them. I was never going to be the kid that was given these lessons and told, hey, we're going to this church now and it's true and, and have accepted that at face value. I needed to 
have an experience myself. And so I went to church, but I didn't like it. I didn't have a testimony because I just didn't really know what I was getting into or what it was all about. And at that point, I just was like, well, whatever, this is what we do. So then my dad retired from the Navy and we moved to Utah. So at that time, I kind of thought, okay, well, we're moving to Utah. This is the you know Mecca of for LDS people. Most of our family is there and you know it's this beautiful place it'll be so fun i won't be one of only a few mormon kids at school so maybe this will help me to understand it better and i will enjoy it better but i was wrong because when we moved to utah i started sixth grade and this was the first time in my life that i experienced bullying i was made fun of almost every single day of sixth grade by one really mean kid and then a bunch of other kids would kind of back him up and the kids wouldn't be my friend. I found that the kids were just really mean. And I would go to church on Sunday and these same kids would be praised for how wonderful they were. And they were the kids that were leaders in the classes. And you know they were passing the sacrament around and giving prayers and giving talks and acting like perfect little angels. And then I would go to school and they were bullying me and other kids. So I fell in with a group of kids. All the kids that were considered the misfits in some way, something about them made them different from the core group. For me, it was because I was moving from somewhere else and I didn't have the big 80s hair and dress like the kids did. I was a tomboy as a child and so I mostly wore corduroy pants and t-shirts or sweatshirts, things like that at that age. The girl that became my best friend was Episcopalian and then there were a few other kids that just, just didn't fit in and so we all became friends. When we moved to junior high school, the bullying stopped. I, I, it wasn't happening as much but the Mormon kids still were kind of the stuck up, not nice kids. But because of the group that I had become friends with, then I then, we then became a bigger group in junior high and these were the rebellious kids. So my junior high experience was smoking and drinking. I didn't do drugs, but all my friends did. And you know, swearing and just being rebellious. We were skaters. It's funny to me now because I see kids out on skateboards and my mind immediately thinks that they're rebellious because I forget that nowadays skateboarding is kind of a normal sport. But when I was in junior high, it was only us bad kids that were skateboarding. I stayed that way all through junior high. During this time, my family was active in the LDS church. We were going, I had to go every single week. I had to go to young women activities. I had to start going to the temple to do baptisms for the dead. And if you don't know what baptisms for the dead are, it is something that they used to kind of do for everybody, that, but the church got in some trouble. Jewish people were upset that they were bab that their ancestors were being baptized into the Mormon church without their consent. So then now it has become something where it, I, it, you have to bring your own names of family and things like that. I don't know how strict it really is, but that's the, uh, the rule that's on paper. But when you are 12 and you enter young men and young women, you can start going to the temple and doing baptisms for the dead. To do this, you have to have an interview with the bishop. You go into his office. Nowadays, they are allowing parents in if you want your parents with you or if the parents want to be there. But that wasn't even something that was talked about when I was a kid. And so it was me as a young 12-year-old girl going into the office alone with this an ad adult man. And he would ask me if I was, you know, keeping the word of wisdom, which is smoking, drinking, uh, drugs, all that. If I dressed modestly, if I was keeping the law of chastity, so you'd have to... Uh, let them know if you were doing anything sexually and they would ask you things like do you believe in the church do you sustain the prophets all of those kinds of things do you pay your tithing which we are all expected to pay 10 percent of any income we get i lied at every time i would go in and i would sit there and i would be terrified because at this point my family is telling me this church is true everyone around me is telling me it's true i think okay it's probably true but i want nothing to do with it and i don't really believe it myself but i don't know and so if it's true, then this guy is going to be able to tell that I'm lying. And he would ask me, you know, do you believe in the church? And I would say, oh, yes, of course. Uh, do you smoke? Do you keep the word of wisdom? And meanwhile, you know, I would have been smoking or drinking within days probably of the interview. And I would say that, of course, I kept the word of wisdom. Thankfully, the chastity questions I could answer honestly, because if you if you do have those issues, they will ask you more questions and they're, it's pretty inappropriate for an adult man to be asking young women or young men those kind of questions, but I never had to deal with that, thankfully. But I would lie and so that I could get my temple recommend because if you couldn't get it, everybody's gonna know that you did something wrong. And you also wouldn't be allowed to take the sacrament in the sacrament meeting. And so everyone around you is gonna know that you did something wrong. 
and there's going to be a lot of shame and probably getting in trouble from your parents because they're going to find out what you're doing. So I would go and do the baptisms and I hated it. I hated putting on the little white outfit. It was a little see-through when it got wet. It was, um, you know, being with the boys and the girls. And these were kids that, like I said, were not nice to me, didn't get along with. I didn't want to go. But my grandma would take me sometimes to do family names. And that I didn't mind as much because at least I was just with my grandma. And so it wasn't as intimidating. So the change came when, when I was about to go into high school. I had a couple of friends that died. And I had a dream that I died and I was in this like cold, dark cell. When I woke up, I was scared and I thought, okay, if I die right now, like they did, I'm going to be in hell. Like that's how I felt. And so that made me think I need to change my life. I need to be doing something that I'm not doing if I want to be able to go to heaven. During those years, I didn't have the relationship with God that I had had when I was a child. But what I did know was that I wanted to change my life and I wanted to get closer to who I used to be and be myself and not be this person that I had become because of my environment and the people I was around. So where I lived, there were two high schools that I could go to. And one of them, all of my friends were going to. And the other one, I didn't know a single person that was going to go to that one. So I decided to go to that one. My best friend was moving away. And this was a perfect opportunity for me to start over and go somewhere that I would have to make all new friends. And I decided I would go day one being that same girl I had been in sixth grade when I first got to Utah and see what happened. At the same time, we had moved into a new ward and this ward was completely different than the one we had lived in before. And I made friends, the kids there were nice. It was a great ward and to this day, it is still my favorite ward I've ever lived in. I made friends with a few kids that then were also going to that high school. And so I realized, okay, I am gonna have a couple of friends at school. We didn't know each other that well yet. School started and it was a completely different experience. I made friends easily and I was having a lot of fun, but there were some other things that were still going on with me. And one day, two of these friends invited me to come to early morning seminary with them. Seminary is for teenagers. I believe it starts in ninth grade, goes up to uh, graduation, and it is an hour away from normal school if you live in Utah. If you live anywhere else, they do it early morning, usually in people's houses or the church. But in Utah, there is a seminary building right next to the junior highs and high schools. So, and then you can have it during your actual school day for a class and you go and you're learning whatever it is that is being learned that year in the the church as a whole. The only reason this was early morning was because they still offered early morning, but it was at the seminary building at the school, but they would do it before school so that if you had too many classes to take a break during the day. And so these two friends both had taken early morning. So we had to get there, I believe it was at 6.30 or seven in the morning that we would start. And up until this point, most of the adult women that I had met in the LDS church didn't seem to really be interested in the things I was interested in. With the exception of my mom, who I always looked up to, I didn't wanna be like the other women in the church. I was a pretty adventurous girl. I, like I said, I was a skater, I was a tomboy. One of my dreams was to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, which I never did do and I don't think I ever will. And I wanted to just travel all over the place and see everything. And when I showed up, the, the seminary teacher for this class was a woman named Sister Doan. And she was amazing. She was awesome. She was so much fun. She was very personable and she had climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And so I immediately felt drawn to her. And then the kids in the class were amazing. I made so many good friends that year. And the first day, she assigned each of us a scripture from Sermon on the Mount because they were studying the New Testament that year. And she gave me the verse about mourning. And since I had just had those friends die in the last couple of months, I'd been feeling that a lot. I felt like I fell into that LDS trap of this was a sign. It cemented that I was supposed to be there in my mind. And then throughout the year, I just, I had so much fun and it was a really good experience. So through my high school years, I never was perfect in every possible way that an LDS girl is supposed to be, but I was very close and I was a, I was a good kid. I enjoyed school. I loved going to church with my friends. I loved going to seminary. My second year of seminary, I had a brother McDonald. He was my teacher and he was another really, really amazing teacher. He was hilarious. He was so fun. Uh, there was one day when I did skip out on class. The next day he said, hey, good to have you back. Next time, bring me some Taco Bell. I was like, how did you know that's where we went? But that's how he was. Like he didn't mark me down. He wasn't, you know, he didn't make me feel terrible. It was just a funny experience. And so through those two years, between my good experiences at church and my good experiences at seminary and with 
Mormon kids as a whole, as most of my friends were Mormon at this point. I really, really believed in it. And the thing is, I knew what was in the Book of Mormon for the most part. I was reading it. I knew what they were teaching me in seminary. I knew what they were teaching me in church. I knew how I felt. I knew how, how good you could feel when you were given you know, a testimony or a story and people were emotional and you would take that, that high elevated emotion onto yourself. I was taught very strongly to believe that that good, peaceful emotion was filling the spirit. And so then of course I started filling the spirit everywhere at church events. And so that testimony was built. I didn't know any of church history. I didn't know most of the true things about the church and a lot of the beliefs I didn't know. What I did know, I thought was all of it. And so I felt very comfortable in believing this is the one true church on this earth. I was very devoted. So I became Laurel president. They used to have names for the age groups in young women, they don't anymore. But I was president of that class. I do remember one hard thing that happened was one day in church, I was walking down the hallway and I was about to go around a corner and I heard some of the church women talking and one of them said to the other one, why did you call Cheryl as the Laurel president? She is not good enough. She is not a good enough example to the other girls to be the Laurel president. And that really hurt my feelings. I felt really, really guilty and shamed and bad of, okay, what have I done wrong that makes her think that? I didn't know if it was just because she knew of my rebellious past. I just didn't know what it was and it made me feel really bad. My senior year in high school, in seminary, I was, my new teacher, I didn't like. He was very, very, very strict. He was a lot more serious than my other two teachers had been and I really didn't like him that much, but I was still put into the seminary presidency. So I definitely was considered a kid by most adults to, that was, I guess, a good example to the other kids of being really religious. But I, I was told many times that if I had a mission in this life, it was to make others feel God's love because I was very happy and very enthusiastic and very outgoing, which is funny because I was still an introvert then and now I'm a reserved introvert. Back then I was an outgoing introvert. My senior year, I also decided that it was very important to me to graduate from seminary and because I had not done it in ninth grade, I wouldn't be able to. So I spent not only an hour during the day in seminary doing that year's study, but I also did what I missed in ninth grade, which was the Old Testament study. What's so funny to me now is just, even though I spent an entire year doing the Old Testament study and then that first year doing the New Testament study, I still didn't know my Bible because all I knew was what they were teaching me and it was bits and pieces here and there. It wasn't front to back. It's never front to back with the Bible. It's always sto a story here, a story there, these verses out of context. Uh, at this time, I considered maybe being a seminary teacher myself. I considered being a seminary teacher for special needs kids. I thought a lot about going on a mission for the church. But at that time, boys would go on missions when they turned 19. And if a girl wanted to go, she had to wait till she was 21, I believe. And so I was certain I would be married before then. And so I didn't think I would be able to go on a mission. Now they've lowered the ages for both. For a while, they got away from the rhetoric of all boys have to go on missions, but now it's back again that it's a duty. You are required. It's a duty to go on a mission, even though the top three leaders of the LDS church right now, none of them did. Uh, but for girls, it's still considered something to like, oh, if you want to do it, you can. And their missions are shorter. The boys go out for two years and the girls go out for a year and a half. For those three years of high school, I had a really good experience, very strong testimony in what I knew, and I loved the church. And my goal in life at that point, my main goal was to make sure I got married in the temple and to a return missionary. And I'd even told guys that I dated that, that I wanted to marry a return missionary. And I know a few of them told me that they went on missions because of that, because they felt like not only me, but other girls, that everybody wanted to marry a return missionary. And that was really the only reason they decided to go. So I continued this way after high school. And that was my full intention to have that kind of life. But then I started dating one of my friends that was not Mormon. And when I first started dating him, I really felt like I was going to be the one that changed him, the one that brought him to the church. My parents had some concerns, but they had liked him, so they didn't really, you know, they didn't interfere or say anything. We dated for a couple of years, and then he did propose to me. I actually had the feeling as soon as he proposed that I wasn't supposed to marry him. I didn't know why I felt that way. When my parents brought up the fact that I wouldn't be able to get married in the temple, it made me kind of double down on the marriage itself because I didn't want to feel like I wasn't marrying him just because he wasn't a Mormon because I felt like, well, that might change later. We ended up getting married, but our marriage was not good. We were way too young to get married. I was 20 and he was a fireman. And that is something that a lot of people that know firemen know that that's not always 
uh, there's not always a lot of fidelity with firemen. I would spend time at the fire station and I could say that only a few of them were faithful to their wives. And so we ended up getting divorced after three years. So I was only 23, already divorced. I was pretty sad. I would, obviously, I felt like a failure. I felt like a failure because I had tried to make it work and it didn't work. And, you know, how could I have this failed marriage? I didn't think that was going to happen to me. But during the time that I was married to him, I didn't want to go to church by myself. And so I stopped going to church during that time. So for three years, I was not an active Mormon. And I still believed in it, but I just, I didn't want to go alone. And so, and so I wasn't living a Mormon lifestyle. We drank alcohol. I'd kind of fallen back into that junior high self a little bit. One day I was at the library at the little town we lived in and I saw a book called The Mormon Murders. And if you saw my recent haul, you'll see that I bought that, a used copy of that book a couple of weeks ago. This is the main reason I bought it. I want to read it again because this was the time when I read it. And this was about Mark Hoffman and the bombings that he did, killing people when it started to be found out that he was forging documents that the LDS church was buying. And this wasn't something that necessarily is completely against the LDS church, except that it shows that they didn't have any discernment toward him as they were meeting with him at the same time he was murdering people and forging things and they didn't know that and were taught that our leaders have so much discernment. But that reminded me of the bishops who didn't know that I was lying to them, that they didn't have any discernment. And now I'm learning that these prophets at the time didn't have discernment. And so it was starting to have these questions in my, my mind. I have been taught that these men speak and act for God. And so they should have all the discernment in the world and that they know things that they can see around corners. It created this huge question in my mind about that. And then I learned about Joseph Smith and his polygamy. And I... I feel like I knew that he was a polygamist before that, but I didn't know that he had had a lot of wives. And I had never read the Doctrine and Covenants chapter about polygamy in a way that helped me to notice when it said that if Emma didn't approve or go along with it, that she would be destroyed. And so when I read that, I was appalled. And so these were my first cracks in my testimony. I moved back in with my parents and I was trying to figure out how to get my life back on track and how to be happy again. And so I immediately went to, in my mind, when was the last time I was happy? That was when I was in high school at that point. Now I can look back and I can say, I can notice how I was trained to do this. During those years in the church, I was trained for this moment. This moment when I asked myself, when was I happy? Oh, it was when I was in high school. Instead of realizing I was happy then because I was being true to myself, and I was doing the things that I believed were right, I thought it only had to do with the church. It's only because I was Mormon that I was happy at that time. I started going to church again. And I put those things, what we say in the LDS church, we, I put them on my shelf. I'm not gonna think about those right now. I, I maybe, you know, maybe sometimes they don't have discernment, but most of the time they do. Joseph Smith's polygamy, just like my ancestors' polygamy, it was for a reason, put it on the shelf. And I stopped worrying about those things. I went to the bishop in my parents' ward. It was a new ward. They had moved during this time as well. And he was a wonderful man. I, I really liked their ward as well. I didn't like it as much as the one I'd been in in high school, but I did really like it. He talked to me about you know, what I'd been doing and where I wanted to go. He made me look at things a little bit differently about you know, what kind of man did I want to marry and then what kind of girl would that guy want to marry. And I started going to church again. I wasn't allowed to take the sacrament at first because I hadn't been going to church for three years and because I had drank during that time. Uh, that's another reason why a lot of us that have left the church at this point are really annoyed sometimes by people now saying, oh, well, you can take the sacrament if you were, you know, doing X, Y, Z and they're at church doing, taking the sacrament and it's no big problem. It's not that we don't, that we want things taken away from other people, but that we just, it's annoying that they don't believe that we weren't able to do it just because we hadn't gone to church or because we'd had alcohol. I started to feel good again, feel good about myself. Look at what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm back in the church and all this, and it didn't heal everything. It didn't make everything better, but I was starting to feel better. And I was feeling proud of myself because everyone around me was proud. During this time that I was inactive, my siblings had all been inactive as well, all for different reasons. A few of them were also starting to try to come back to church at this time. None of us really talked about our reasons for leaving or our reasons for coming back. And we all just were kind of doing the same thing. And I would justify the things that I learned and wanted to talk about while I was inactive by saying that 
The reason I couldn't leave the church alone was because I was trying to justify my actions and my not going, which was true at the time. It's not true now, but it was then because I did still believe in it. But I felt a lot of guilt for not living that lifestyle. So fast forward, I got on classmates.com. Since I had been happy in high school, I wanted to connect with the church, but I also wanted to connect with old friends. And most of them I had lost contact with. And I saw a couple of my really good friends from high school on there. And so I emailed them and started talking to a few of them. And one of them was my husband. So we decided, we emailed each other back and forth for a while. And then he decided to come down to my house and visit one day. We both thought it was just gonna be a hangout for a couple hours, catch up on each other's lives and then go our separate ways. But he ended up staying the whole night and you know, watching a movie with me and my parents and we talked a lot and we started dating after that. So he comes from a very religious, a very, very devout Mormon family. And he had been raised in the church his whole life. He had been on a mission and you know, he didn't have any doubts. He wasn't somebody that was just perfect at everything, but he didn't have any doubts. And I even used to wear a cross necklace like I do now. And while we were dating, he one time broached the subject and said, hey, you know, I'm kind of uncomfortable with your cross necklace that you wear because he'd been raised to believe that we shouldn't wear crosses and that it was wrong. And now again, that's something that now in the church is becoming more common, but back then um, it was a no-no. And so I did, I stopped wearing my cross necklaces because it made me feel guilty and I wanted to, I didn't want to make him feel uncomfortable. So we dated for a couple of years. I was very intent this time to make sure that I was, you know, marrying somebody that not only LDS as well, but also would that I was really, really good friends with. I wouldn't have to deal with the things I dealt with in my first marriage. And we were, we were really good friends. It was just really fun hanging out with him and his friends. And in August of 2003, we got engaged and we decided to get married that December. So I had to then prepare for going through the temple. Women or people who haven't gone on missions will go through the temple for what's called their endowment on the same day as their wedding. But I was doing it a few days before. There are some that might watch this that might get offended by some of the details I'm going to give. But to me, it is not sacred anymore. So I am going to talk about it however I need to. It's very important to me to be able to share my experience and that's going to be talking a little bit about things that some people consider sacred. I went into the endowment and I had no, no idea what to expect because we're not allowed to talk about the temple outside of the temple. My mom helped me to go to Deseret Book, which is a local LDS bookstore where they also sell, they have a special section you can get into if you have a temple recommend. And we could go in there and buy garments, which are the under clothes that Mormons wear. And I could get temple clothes. So we bought those things there and little pouch that has all of the extra things you have to wear in the temple, which we didn't go through. I didn't know what was really in the pouch. I didn't know why I needed those things, but I showed up for the day to get my temple endowment with my little pouch full of unmentionable miscellaneous items, my temple dress to wear and garments to put on after I was told to. At this point, I was very devout. I believed in it 100% again. I was very happy in that belief and this is what I wanted. I wanted to get my temple endowment. I wanted to get married in the temple. I wanted to have the typical LDS life. We went into first into the dressing room where I was given some special clothes and I had to first go get my anointing. It's an oil anointing. My brother had scared me before going saying that I was going to have to be naked. But um, thankfully I wasn't. It was like, a, I don't even know how to describe it, but it was kind of like a smock that was open at the sides. And I know they've changed this since then. I talked about this in one of my No Man Knows My History videos, but at this time they would put their hands, the woman would put her hands through the side and, and touch me on the different parts of the body that they were anointing with oil. It was uncomfortable because I'm a pretty modest person and I felt a little uncomfortable with the woman touching me, but it was also new and so kind of overwhelming that I just, I wasn't thinking about it too much. You can go online or you can go back to my video that talked about the temple and see a little bit more detail of that. But she did all of that and then at that point I could put on the garments and have to wear them from that point forward. And then I had to get my new name. I knew that you got a new name in the temple and I believed that they were giving you your real name. This was your real name in heaven because LDS, you believe in a pre-existence where we've all lived for who knows how long before we came here. You already know who your family is gonna be and you already know what your whole life is gonna be like, what trials you're gonna have and everything and you still choose to come. So I believed this was my name in heaven. So I was given my name, I didn't like it. So now I know 
that every girl who went through that temple on the same day as me had the same name because they have a name for every day of the month and everybody gets the same name. But at and that was actually something I'll talk about in the next video that was really hard for me to learn because I didn't know that. Since my siblings were had not been active, none of them had gotten to the point where they had temp temple recommends yet because you have to not only be living a certain kind of life to get your temple recommend, but you have to have been paying your tithing for a certain amount of time. Once you start coming active and start paying your tithing again, then the, the ticker starts counting. And so none of my siblings were able to be there with me for this endowment session or for my wedding. My parents were there, but my grandma was there. My grandpa had passed away by this time already. I had a few aunts and uncles and Doug was there and his family was there. And my bishops that I had had that had helped me through this time. So we were all in this chapel. You can sit there and you can kind of quietly talk or read your scriptures. There's nice music playing. And then they'll come in and say, okay, you know, who's coming in for this session? When you're going through for your first time, they give you a special little badge. So everybody knows it's your first time. And then you have somebody that's supposed to be your chaperone that's with you to help you. So that was my mom. And so we go in and we had to sit on the front row. So me and any other girls that were going through for the first time were in the front row. They separate men and women in the temple. So the women were on one side, the men are on the other. And by this time I have just my temple dress on, that's all. My soon to be husband at that point, he's sitting over on the men's side, I'm sitting over on the women's side. My mom is next to me, my mother, soon to be mother-in-law is behind me and the session starts. I didn't go to the temple I was gonna get married in. I went to one that was closer to where I was living at the time. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what it was gonna be, but it was a movie. So it was a movie talking about the creation and it goes through the creation of all the animals and of the earth and then Adam and Eve. And then at different parts of the movie, it stops, it pauses, and they have you do things that you see in the movie. So they teach you different handshakes that are called your signs or tokens, and they each have a name and some kind of phrase that goes with it. And so you have, they say it, they teach it to you, and then somebody comes around and does the handshake with each person. It also asks you at the end to like, that you've made some covenant and you have to bow your head and say yes. During this time, you also start putting on the clothes that are in the pouch. There was a robe that you would put on. At one point, you would put it over one shoulder and then partway through, you'd have to take off everything and put the robe back on on the other shoulder. I don't, they don't do that anymore, I don't think. And there were you know, slippers that you'd take on and off. There was a sash. There was apron that looked that was green. Everything else is completely white, but the apron was green. Mine looked like a little leaf. And then I had a veil. I started out with a veil that was just like kind of like a bonnet with a veil. And then it had a, a, has a tie that you have to tie on a certain part of your face. It always has to be on the same side. And but then later on, because it would always slip off my head and I was so self-conscious about it, then I got one that had like a clip that had a clip in it so that it was easier to put on and stay on. So all of this is very overwhelming and weird to me of like, why am I learning handshakes? Why do I have to have handshakes to get into the celestial kingdom? This doesn't make sense. But OK, you know, I, it's fine. I knew that it would be different, but I didn't really know how. I was surprised at how little Jesus was in the film and in the presentation and yet Satan was there the whole time he was you know talking to Adam and Eve and then he talked to us directly he gave he actually threatened you I don't know if they still do that in the movie anymore but he would threaten us that if we didn't live up to everything that we had covenanted to in the temple that day we would be under his power that was pretty frightening and at one point they have people go up to the front to this altar and they do a prayer circle and I've heard from a lot of people that on your first time you have to go up in the prayer circle but I didn't. So I don't know if that was something I was supposed to do and just didn't. And I had people wondering why I wasn't going or what, but I didn't go up. I was pretty stressed during the whole endowment session of like trying to get things on fast enough and trying to make sure I was doing things right. And the last thing I wanted to do was get up in front of everybody there and have them seeing me do stuff. They went up and they did the prayer circle. They all had to have their hands on the shoulder of the person in front of them. So they're all touching around the thing. The women had to veil their faces. This is something you don't have to do anymore apparently, but I did. So I put the veil over my face and looking through the veil up at the front of this room with a circle of people in these clothes before the actual prayer, they started chanting. So we had to say, oh God, hear the words of my mouth. And we had to put our arms up above our head and lower our hands as we said it. We did it a few times. And as I was watching them do that at the front of the room through my veil, darkest feeling encompassed my whole body. And in my brain, I was shouting, oh my word, it is a cult, it is a cult, it is a cult. And I just started having tears pouring down my cheeks. I was so shook up. So then they said the prayer, but I'm not paying attention. I'm just crying and I'm trying to stay silent. I wanted to get up and run out, but I look across the aisle and I see Doug 
sitting over there. I know his mom is sitting behind me. I know that if I get up and leave this room, I'm going to ruin the event for everybody else there. It's going to cause a huge spectacle. It's going to be embarrassing for me and for everybody with me. And so I decided I'm not going to do that. But at this point, I decided that once I got through this, I was going to tell everybody, I'm sorry, but I'm out. I can't do this. I, that was terrible. That was horrifying. It was so scary. Then I realized Doug might not marry me. If I say this, he might not marry me. And it's only a couple of days before my wedding. And I believe this is why they don't let, they don't want you or encourage you to do this endowment before your wedding or your mission. They want it either right before you go through your wedding or right before you go on a mission so that you have that feeling of, I have to do this if I want to go. I believe that is done on purpose. I'm able to calm myself down. When we unveil our faces, I'm, you know, I kind of adapted my face. And if anyone saw that I had been crying, they would have, for sure, they would have thought that it was because I was touched by the spirit. They wouldn't have known why I was crying because other people cry and you just always assume that it's because they're being touched or inspired or they're feeling emotional in a good way. Then at the end, you have to go up to this veil. They, they have this curtain go up and there's this kind of see-through veil there with holes in it. You'll go up with one of the older workers. We had to kind of stand to the side to go through last. And so everybody else went first and then we got to go through. I went up and there was a man on the other side of the veil and then there was a woman standing next to me. They have a mallet that they hit against like a pipe or something that's there. You do the handshakes through the veil. At one point then at the end, you put your hand through on his shoulder. He put his hand through onto my shoulder and then there was one bigger part that was a longer, like paragraph you had to say. This is something that was hard for me. I could never remember it. When I stopped, the woman would feed the lines to me and I would repeat them. And so since this was my first time going through, but it wasn't for a mission, it was for marriage, then they had my future husband come up behind the man and he pulled me through the veil. So it was symbolic of later on when we died that in Mormon theology, your husband brings you into heaven. So you can't go there unless he knows your name and he pulls you through. So he knew my new name, but I could never know his name. Doug pulls me through. So at this point, I am still freaked out. I am upset. I want to tell him I can't do this. That was crazy. I Are you gonna still marry me if we don't go to get married in the temple? He's very happy and beaming. And we go through into the celestial room. The celestial room is beautiful. The temples are always designed with a lot of money. There, there's a lot of money involved. They are beautiful, they are clean, they are quiet, they are so peaceful. They create the atmosphere they wanna create with their furnishings and the environment. Takes me into the celestial room and my parents are there, his family is there, my bishops are there. All of these people that I love are smiling at me and they're crying out of happy tears and they're like, oh, isn't it wonderful? Aren't you so happy? And I did what I would do for the next 20 years anytime anything bothered me. All of these people are smart people. I love all these people. I respect all these people. And they've all been through what I just went through and none of them had a problem with it. Look at them, they're so happy. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. It isn't a cult. It isn't, that wasn't weird. It's, it's me. I'm missing something important in me. I'm in the wrong. And so I let it go. And I walked in and I just acted happy and I didn't tell tell them in that moment what happened. Afterward, I did tell my husband how I'd felt. I did tell him everything that happened. It wasn't like I pretended it didn't with him or with my parents. I told my parents about it. Doug, of course, was sympathetic to my feelings, but he was like, oh, I don't know. I, I never thought it was that weird. And that was a pattern I would then see again for the next 20 years. If any time I brought it up with somebody, if I said, oh, I was really freaked out my first time, I would never go into the details, but I would say that and people would be like, really? Oh, it was so beautiful. I loved it so much. And so many people around me would always say how much they loved going to the temple and how much they loved doing endowment sessions. And so I always felt like there was something wrong with me because I didn't like it and I was freaked out by it. But it kind of became a joke instead of being something that I let myself take seriously about myself. And so unfortunately, <laughs> that was what happened. And so a couple of days later, we went to the Salt Lake Temple in downtown where my parents have been married, Doug's parents have been married, and we went in to get married. So first we went into a little room where there was some paperwork done, and then I went up to the bride's dressing room to change into my wedding dress and get ready for the actual wedding. I went in and in the room, there were other girls that were getting married that day, and everybody was just getting changed. And I said, where do I change? And the woman said, right here. And she was very, very rude. My mom will agree to it because my mom was with me. And 
I wasn't going to get undressed and dressed in front of these other girls. I didn't even know them. And so I had to go into like this little bathroom stall and get changed into my wedding dress with the door open with my mom trying to help me. It was so uncomfortable and I felt so weird. Um, I came out and my dress was extremely modest, but my sleeves were quarter length sleeves. So since they didn't come all the way to my wrist, they had to put in some lace inserts to my wrist. But then I had to put on those temple clothes over my wedding dress. And this was a wedding dress that I designed. My sister-in-law helped me to sew. So I was very excited about this, you know, Victorian style dress. I, I was so happy about it and I had to cover it for my wedding with a robe and a sash and the green leaf apron. Wear those little slippers and wear the ugly veil. My husband was in a white shirt, white pants, his robe, all of his things, and a hat that I can only describe as looking like a baking hat. I went back into the little dressing room where all the other brides were waiting for their turn. And there's a bunch of different ceiling rooms, so it wasn't like we were one after another, but we each had different times. And I went in there and I decided to freshen my lipstick. So I pulled out my lipstick out of a little bag that I had and the, the room is covered in mirrors. So I went up to a mirror and started putting on lipstick and this little old lady yells at me that this is not the place to put on makeup. She made me feel so small and so stupid. And Doug, meanwhile, it's kind of a funny story that he tells. He was out waiting in the little waiting room for the husbands and he watched one after another, the other girls come out beaming and happy and the men, you know, going over to the, get their wife to go into the room to get married. And he was rehearsing what he would say to me when he saw me and how I was gonna be so happy and radiant like all the other girls. And I came out again, tears in my eyes. And I was like, the lady was so mean to me. And it just, I mean, it's a funny story now, but it was just like so dramatic in the moment. And I'm not a very dramatic girl. And so it was, so he did not expect that at all. We went into the room and they have an altar and you kneel on next to this altar. And then the people that you've invited for your wedding are, um, either behind you or behind your spouse and there's mirrors that make it so that you can kind of just see into eternity and uh, that's all symbolic and then we had a man I don't remember his name I don't know who he was he was somebody that worked in the temple that married us and usually they'll give a little bit of a speech something that they feel it's important to talk about and then they'll talk about church stuff and you know go through all of the things that you have to know in the temple and then marry you I don't remember a single thing. I don't remember anything he said. I don't remember anything about my ceremony. I remember just being happy that I was marrying him, but I don't remember anything else about it. My parents, my aunts and uncles, my grandma, my cousin, they were there. Other than that, I had, I had nobody else in my family. None of my siblings could be there for my wedding. It's really sad. They were all downstairs waiting, uh, either in the waiting room or outside. Doug's family was, all of them were there. I do remember feeling very disappointed that I had to be covered in those temple clothes and that my siblings couldn't be there, but it was still a good experience. I still was very happy to be married. And then we went on in our life uh, and we were happy. I did notice that the first couple of years of my, our marriage, we had two different wards and I never felt like I fit in there. Uh, and then we moved to Wisconsin. We had a great ward there. We, you know, had, our first daughter then we had our second daughter while we were living in wisconsin and out there we felt very much a part of the group all we had a bunch of friends in the ward we felt very comfortable we loved it and it was a really good experience when we moved back to utah just like everything else it we just never had that as good of an experience again we had different wards that we just didn't fit in. There was the first ward we lived in in Utah. I would go to church and the women would be really nice to me. And then I would see them out and about and they wouldn't even say hi to me. And I just never felt like I fit in any ever. Everybody dressed the same way and everybody had the same hairstyle. And they all, their houses were all decorated the same. And they all did their, you know, group date nights to the temple and you know, they just were interested in things I wasn't interested in, in. And it was just a very weird thing because in Kenosha, in Wisconsin, I think that we fit in in that ward because a lot of the people were living far away from their families. And it was a, it felt like it was kind of just a melting pot of different personalities and different kinds of people. But here in Utah, it is very different and it definitely is very clicky and there's definitely a mold that you need to fit. We were, you know, very active. We raised our kids in it. We did family home evening. We did scripture study as a family. Did all the things we were supposed to do. Our kids knew who the prophets were. We watched general conference twice a year where 
that you stay home from church that su- Sunday and on Saturday and Sunday, the leaders of the church give talks. We gave talks in church. We gave prayers in church. We had callings. We paid tithing. We did all the things you were supposed to do. The funny thing now is I think people, a lot of times when you leave the church, people will say, oh, you didn't have enough faith. You know, you didn't ever really believe. And I'll go more into that in the next video. This one obviously is already getting long. I, I didn't have that experience. I fully believed in it during our marriage years. And yet there were things I didn't like. I never liked visiting teaching. And that was something where women would be, we would be given a woman companion and we would have women we were supposed to go visit and teach whatever lesson they wanted us to teach that month. And I didn't like doing that because it felt like forced friendship. It felt like we were being forced to visit people that I might've visited otherwise anyway, but I'm being forced to. And there's women being forced to visit me. So I could never tell if they were really my friends or if they were only coming because they needed to mark a box. And we were being told what we had to say when we're there. It had to follow a formula with, with prayer and the lesson and all those things. And I never liked doing that. And sometimes I just didn't feel like going to church. And sometimes we would miss church. I didn't like praying in front of people. I never felt like felt right about that. And I think that goes back to when I was a kid, how when I prayed, I felt so strongly I was just talking to God I was having a conversation and so when I would pray out loud in public and I felt like there were certain things I had to say because there is a formula for Mormon prayers as well I I knew everybody was listening to me and they were going to critique my prayer so I was worried about what I was saying and so I didn't feel like I was talking to God I felt like I was talking to the audience whoever was listening to me and so there were things like that that bothered me and I never ever enjoyed going to the temple I got to the point where I would like going and doing initiatories which is just the oil part because you could go in and you could just do that over and over and over again. And I didn't mind that, but I didn't like going to the endowments. And no matter how many times we went, I could never remember the last part that I needed at the Vell. And so I felt so stupid. Kept asking myself, why can't I remember this? You cannot talk about the temple outside of the temple. So I couldn't go home and practice it. And if I asked questions of my husband, we couldn't really talk. He'd say, oh, okay, we'll have to talk about that the next time we're at the temple. In the celestial room, you talk about it as much as you can, but there's still things that you can't really talk about. And that whole time, I was 100% a believer. I believed in it with all of my heart, but because there were certain things that didn't sit right with me or that I didn't enjoy, I always felt like there was something wrong with me. It was never something in the church that was wrong. It was never anything to be questioned. It was me. I was so fatally flawed. And this was different than the idea of, oh, we're all sinners. This was a We're all divine beings. So we're supposed to be perfect. We're supposed to be getting to perfection. And I am so flawed and I'm not improving. What is wrong with me? I'm never going to be good enough. There was a lot of that going on in my head during all of those years. I questioned myself so much and I felt so down on myself. It was really hard to feel like I never could fit in and that I was just always the the black sheep, the the odd man out, the, the person that didn't like the things that everybody else seemed to be okay with. And so I just pushed it down as much as I could, but I never felt good about myself as a Mormon, as an adult. And yet I was teaching it to my kids. And I was sometimes answering questions to my kids in a way that wasn't okay because I was trying to prove something or not let my true feelings about something come out. So I'll go more into that in the next video. But that was my experience as a Mormon. I have not been Mormon my whole life but I have been very, very faithful and devoted for most of it. I think it's important to lay that groundwork because like I said, most people will say you left the church because you wanted to sin. You left the church because you weren't faithful enough, but that plays into what I just said of it's something wrong with me, not wrong with the church. In my next video, if I, if I've forgotten anything today, since I didn't script this out, I didn't, I was gonna make an outline, but I didn't. There's probably a few things that I've forgotten that I wanted to say. So if if I have any of those, then for next week's video, I'll probably do kind of a review and then um, I'll get into what led to me and my family actually leaving the church. What are our reasons and how did we get there?